Awesome. I'm glad I look relatively decent today. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I mean, you got the bow tie, you got the whole thing going on. Oh, thank goodness I prepared. All right. <laughs> Welcome. I'm here with uh, Dr. Joseph Cherby from Infectious Disease. Why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? So thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Joseph Cherby. I use he, they pronouns. I am an infectious diseases physician here at Washington University in St. Louis. I work primarily in Barnes Jewish Hospital, but I also work in the St. Louis County Sexual Health Clinic. So I am the current director of the CDC Track 2B Capacity Building Assistance Program, which works on HIV prevention in the region, as well as the Associate Medical Director for the St. Louis STI HIV Prevention Training Center, which provides training on STIs and HIV within the um, surrounding region. And I'm the Associate Medical Director for the Sexual Health Clinic um, in the North, uh, in St. Louis County. So I, I wear quite a few hats, but you're making I, feel lazy here. We should do that. <laughs> I also just primarily work in HIV, STIs, and LGBTQIA plus health here at WashU with a huge focus on medical education curriculum as well. Well, great. So I'm glad you're here. Um, it's for this topic, we want to talk about mycoplasma um, mm -hmm. as an STI which for some reason is something I don't remember learning about in medical school, but maybe I just forgot. So maybe you could tell me, you know, why is this an important topic? What are mycoplasma as an STI? And uh, yeah, why is it important? So you didn't miss out on anything in medical school. This is just recently been increasingly recognized as a cause of sexually transmitted infections and, and specifically urethritis and cervicitis, right? So in recent years, and it wasn't until this iteration of the guidelines that mycoplasma genitalium was recognized as a possible cause of non-gonococcal urethritis, or in other words, a, a urethritis that is caused by something other than gonorrhea. So it's actually been quite known for quite some time that this, this could possibly cause a urethritis or a cervicitis. And in other parts of the world, such as in Japan and Australia, this is normally tested for along with the slew of other STIs that can cause urethritis and cervicitis, them being gonorrhea, chlamydia, and, and syphilis in, in certain instances as well. So mycoplasma genitalium, for our end, though, we have recently been recognizing that this is an increasing cause and it is increasingly associated with non-gonococcal urethritis and non-resolving cervicitis as well. So, Notice I'm mentioning, though, mycoplasma genitalium and not just mycoplasma as a bacteria overall, because there are other mycoplasma. There's mycoplasma hominis, and a lot of people get confused as well with ureoplasma, both of which exist in the urinary tract and are viewed as colonizers there, but aren't necessarily causes of non-gonococcal urethritis in the way that mycoplasma genitalium is. Okay, wow. So, all right. So, there's mycoplasma hominis and mm -hmm. ureoplasma that mm -hmm. colonize all of our urinary tracts. Yes. But we're specifically talking about mycoplasma genitalium as yep. a sexually transmitted infection that causes actual symptoms that we're concerned about. Yeah, it's actually associated okay. with around 15 to 20 percent of non-gonococcal urethritis. And for non-chlamydial non-gonococcal urethritis, it goes up to 20 to 25 percent. This is something we're actively monitoring right now just to kind of see what background rates look like, but it is increasingly being associated with these entities. Okay. Well, I was going to ask why is this important for us to know about in the ED, but I think that pretty much answers it right there. I mean, I'm sure we're seeing patients with this. And so sounds like we need to be thinking about it. Um, now, just briefly, if we could geek out for a second about mycoplasma, why is this something we didn't know about before? Is this an intracellular bacteria or what makes this such a mysterious uh, new disease? It's an intracellular bacteria. It's very hard to culture, right? So it requires specific testing. Uh, and the testing that we do is going to be a PCR test. That PCR test was just approved for urogenital sampling, such as urethral swabs, uh, endocervical swabs, um, and in the urine in 2019. So this, this is recently FDA approved. It's 
but culturing for it is quite difficult and it's quite time intensive. So this is why, and they are notoriously difficult to culture because they lack a cell wall. They are just very, very difficult. And that also goes into why they're difficult to treat as well. You can imagine most of our, most of our antimicrobials attack cell wall formation, right? And so if you don't have that, then you're left with a, only a handful of antibiotics left. But it is just something that we have been increasingly noted. And these are these are bacteria, like I said, that we've noticed in this area before, but we haven't been able to associate them with these specific disease entities. Now there's increasing evidence for a causal association or just an increased likelihood of them causing these diseases. Okay, that makes sense. So let's talk about how is it transmitted mm -hmm. and how does it present? So... Mycoplasma genitalium in and of itself is something that we need to consider, not straight from the get-go when we're seeing a run-of-the-mill urethritis, not straight from the get-go when we're seeing a run-of-the-mill cervicitis, okay? And it definitely should not be tested for an asymptomatic individuals. The way that it's transmitted is through sexual intercourse, um, and it is found in the genitourinary tract, okay? Whether there, there have been studies looking to see if it is found in the oropharynx. There are studies to look if it's found in the rectum, but we haven't been able to definitively find where, what the exact location is other than outside of the genitourinary tract at this okay. point. So it can be transmitted as a sexually transmitted infection, but the way that we test for it and when we test for it is really specific. So first and foremost, the most common causes of urethritis um, in individuals with a penis are going to be your gonorrhea and your chlamydia. That is the same for cervicitis, right? Gonorrhea, chlamydia. And then for cervicitis, you also have trichomonas vaginalis as well as um, other causes of, of vaginitis, right? So, but mycoplasma genitalium is to be considered once you have done treatment for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and the, the symptoms have not resolved. So for individuals with a penis, you know, usually we would expect symptoms to resolve after four to seven days of treatment for non-gonococcal urethritis specifically, or even gonococcal urethritis. But if that doesn't resolve, if the patient is still reporting pain with urination, is still reporting some discharge, then that is when we really should start considering for mycoplasma genitalium. And that's what I tell every one of my patients. If this isn't resolving in four to seven days, and if it you know, if, for example, you finish treatment and, and the, the symptoms come back, you really need to come back for testing because we need to start looking for well, mycoplasma genitalia. What genitalia. if people are, are getting tested and were negative for all those things, so you never treated them? That would, I guess, be the same scenario. Yeah, it would be rare if a person was coming into my office and had a, a really bad pain with urination and had some discharge then. And if the testing came back negative, Automatically, I would start on treatment straight from the get-go, just personally, just because a patient is presenting with certain symptoms, I, I would like to get them treated while they're in my office. Usually, I'll get a result within 24 hours, but if they come back negative, then I would want them to come back for mycoplasma genitalium testing, because then that is a cause of non-gonococcal urethritis in this situation, and we just want to make sure that we're keeping that in our differential, especially if all of the tests come back negative. But the most common causes of these symptoms of urethritis specifically is going to be your gonorrhea and your chlamydia. Okay, but it's going to, you know, clinically present similar to, I guess, gonorrhea and chlamydia mm -hmm. with penile or cervical discharge and burning with urination. Yes, basically yeah. burning with urination. In individuals with a penis, you're going to have your typical, you might have some discharge, but mainly it's associated with that pain with urination um, and some inflammation within the urethra. As for individuals with a uterus and a cervix and persons with pelvic inflammatory disease, for example, this has been, there have been noted higher rates of mycoplasma genitalium in individuals with pelvic inflammatory disease compared to individuals without pelvic inflammatory disease. But we're still trying to figure out what the what the um, significance of this is. Okay. So, so we're not sure whether it can progress or cause a clinical PID or not. Exactly. We okay. just know that there is higher rates within within this group. So what I what I want to emphasize here though is is that we should be testing if individuals are symptomatic. 
right. asymptomatic testing is not going to necessarily um, is not recommended currently. And so right now the testing what's, is recommended. What's the reason for that? Is that because there are a lot of people who will test positive and have no symptoms? So therefore. Yeah, so we don't know the significance of in asymptomatic individuals if we are to find mycoplasma genitalium, right? Like we don't know necessarily if this is going to develop into a symptomatic non-gonococcal urethritis. We don't know if this is going to develop into a pelvic inflammatory disease. So right now the recommendation is to test individuals who are symptomatic because we don't know the what what would happen if individuals are asymptomatic. Now, similar to it progressing to a PID for, you know, people with penises, can this progress to an orchitis, an epididymitis? So far, there hasn't been any kind of association that we have found with higher rates of epididymitis, orchitis, or any of these other entities that we have associated with, for example, if we leave chlamydia untreated. Okay. So it hasn't necessarily been associated with that. Now, there are some smaller studies in individuals with a vagina and the cervix that have shown that individuals who test positive have a higher rate of possible PID. There is also a possible rate in individuals who are pregnant with premature um, delivery, for example. So I, I just want to, um, and preterm labor. So uh, there are certain associations within that population. But again, we're learning more as we're going. Yeah, and we're trying to figure, exactly. And we're trying oh. to figure out what is associated with this, you know, with this organism that we are just recently finding out the the increasing significance of. Yeah. So I get why maybe we shouldn't necessarily be testing asymptomatic people as a screen, but why shouldn't we be testing for this upfront when someone has, say, dysuria? You know, why wouldn't we just send gonorrhea, chlamydia, and mycoplasma all upfront? A availability of testing is is important. So if you have if you have access to the test, then that's fantastic. Not a lot of places have this assay available. But also the thing is is we want to be able to how can I put this clearly? Right now we don't have enough evidence to show that testing regularly on all patients who are symptomatic is 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 important, right? Like we we don't have enough evidence to show how beneficial it is. And, and furthermore, let's say someone tests positive and then what, what for example, do we do with their, their partners? For example, do we treat their partners? And we're still gaining this information as to so far treating your partners has not shown to be, to show any benefit in, in terms of um, recurrence or if the partner develops any, any symptoms, for example. But the, the issue is, is that Right now, we don't have, a lot of places don't have access to testing. Testing is expensive. And not only that, what we have as well is a situation in which we have a drug, uh, sorry, we have a bacteria that is very difficult to treat because of developing antimicrobial resistance. We do have high rates of macrolide resistance within this um, organism. We do have increasing rates of fluoroquinolone resistance. And so therefore we really want to be targeted in who we test and treat, because if we test everyone, and for example, that's not the causative agent, we might be inadvertently developing resistance resistance within that group. Okay. Well, before we get to treatment, which I want to get to, um, when it comes to testing, you mentioned that it could be a cervical swab, a urethral swab, or off the urine are the sensitivities and specificities roughly the same for this? Is it okay to just do it off the urine or? Yeah, so I mean, it has been FDA cleared for urine, urethral, penile swabs, endocervical swabs and vaginal swabs. Um, the sensitivities are, are good across the board. Um, and so it is, it is a nucleic acid amplification test. It's, it's, a, it's quite a sensitive test. Um, so Right now, that's the whole logic test is the one that we are using. That's the only FDA approved one for that, um, for testing for mycoplasma genitalia. Okay. All right. So this is the question I've been waiting for. But once mm -hmm. we diagnose it, how do we treat it? Perfect. So this is the interesting part for me because um, the treatment is is a little bit, you have to hang on for me because some of it might not necessarily make sense. So no, this, that's remember, not a good sign when an ID doc says that. <laughs> no. no, no, this is, this is fantastic. But the way that we treat it, remember when I said that 
right now there are increasing amounts of macrolide resistance, right? We're seeing this across the board. We're seeing this with gonorrhea. We're seeing this in mycoplasma genitalia. And because we're using macrolides such as azithromycin for a wide variety of other disease processes, right? So with mycoplasma genitalia, we have noticed in other parts of the world where they are testing more regularly, we have noticed that there is an increasing amount of azithromycin resistance. So the testing, the treatment algorithm is based off of if you have access to antimicrobial resistance testing. Plot twist, not many of us have access to this testing. So right oh, you mean, now, so wait, say, say that again, that kind of went over my head a little bit. So you mean in addition to performing the mycoplasma mm -hmm. NAT test, you also perform another test to check the resistance of that? Yes, there are certain testing oh. modalities that allow us to test for presence of macrolide resistance within mycoplasma genitalium. But not many people have access to this testing as well. So <laughs> what that ultimately means is that if we can't test for it, we are going to assume and treat as if this is a macrolide resistant strain, because we know that fluoroquinolones are more effective in this scenario, specifically moxifloxacin. So the treatment is doxycycline, 100 milligrams BID for one week, followed by moxifloxacin, 400 milligrams once daily for seven days. So it's a two-week total treatment. That's a, that's a big course right there. Exactly. But what we've noticed is, and, and this is why I wanted you to hang on for me, because doxycycline is not necessarily considered to be effective against mycoplasma, right? Doxycycline is one of these, um, these antimicrobials that isn't typically associated with working against this type of organism. What it has shown though is uh, in studies that have looked at this sequential strategy that doxycycline is able to lower the organism load just enough to make moxifloxacin more effective. And so this was actually studied in Australia, and they actually showed that this was the more effective way of getting rid of oh, um, mycoplasma genitalium. So all of this is to say, and I want you to remember this, though. Remember when I said that if a patient has non-gonococcal urethritis, our presumption is that typically this is associated with chlamydia. Sure. The new guidelines for chlamydia treatment are doxycycline 100 milligrams BID for seven days, correct? And so that way, if, for example, a patient isn't having resolution of their symptoms by four to seven days, then typically I want them to call me back so that I can test and possibly give them a treatment for moxiflox with moxifloxacin in order to try to not have to make them do the doxy and moxy all over again. So, right. so just dovetail it right into it. Ex exactly. Wow. Okay. But you're saying some of these mycoplasma genitalium may just respond to azithromycin alone. Yes. So the if if the patient has, you know, if we can show that this is macrolide susceptible, then you can use the doxycycline followed by azithromycin one gram orally once, followed by 500 once daily for three days. Did you get all of that? It's a yeah. lot. But I, all of this is available on the STI treatment guidelines. All of the dosing regimens are available right there. But what I do want to highlight, though, is with the increasing amount of macrolide resistance, the majority of us are actually using this moxifloxacin regimen sure. because we know that macrolide resistance is on the rise. And in certain places in the world, it's it's startlingly high. Yeah. And so I just want to make sure that we give our patients the best treatment possible. And that would be using doxycycline followed by moxifloxacin. Okay. This, this macrolide resistance test, is that something you just like, if you had were to have it, I don't know if I have access to that, but that is that something you would just reflex off of the original sample and it's another PCR type test or something? Yes, they are testing for certain genes that allow that that specify for macrolide resistance. And so there is a there is a certain resistance modality, but again, not many places have access to this. It is very, okay. very restricted at this time. Wow. Okay. So what are the sort of general outcomes after treatment that we're seeing? The general outcomes after treatment that we are currently seeing is actually quite 
good. A lot of people have resolution of their symptoms. Usually they'll notice, they'll note that after that moxifloxacin treatment is where they saw a marked resolution of their symptoms. And so it is, it is important for us to, you know, differentiate this in that situation. You know, for example, I've had patients where I've empirically treated for mycoplasma genitalium when I didn't have access to testing right away based off of the fact that the patient's symptoms did not resolve yeah. and had negative gonorrhea and chlamydia testing, right? So I trialed a doxy followed by moxifloxacin for these patients. And I've actually found that a lot of them surprisingly do have resolution of symptoms, especially with that moxifloxacin. And for, for me, that would be a presumptive, this is most likely mycoplasma genitalium was playing a role in this situation. But again, we are noticing that there are high rates of mycoplasma genitalium. We are noticing, you know, we, we have seen background rates of around like up to like 25% of, of individuals who are getting urethral swabs in STI settings. There is a study that is ongoing right now. And so keep a lookout for that. But the, the whole point of what I'm trying to say is that this is something that is floating around in the background in our patients with non-gonococcal urethritis who continue to be symptomatic, this is definitely one of the first and foremost things that we should consider treating. Along with the likes of, for example, in cisgender men who have sex with cisgender women, treating empirically for trichomonas vaginalis as well, right? So my algorithm is as such, if a patient is presenting with non-gonococcal urethritis and their symptoms don't resolve, if they are cisgender men who have sex with cisgender women, then I would want to make sure to empirically treat for trichomonas vaginalis um, and mycoplasma genitalium. However, if they are cisgender men who have sex with cisgender men, I can knock off the trichomonas vaginalis. That's not likely going to be playing a role in MSM. And I would treat empirically for mycoplasma genitalium. Love that. That makes a lot of sense. So I guess I'm starting to understand why we're being so sparse about the testing because it's a big treatment and there may be a large prevalence of people that have this. Not all of them are having symptoms. So it's only really if we're seeing these symptoms that haven't responded to other things or you know it's not something else, then we start looking for this. Exactly. And we're still finding out the, the relevance of asymptomatic carriage of this of this bacteria. We're still learning as we're going, right? We're still finding the significance. We just found the significance in the association with non-gonococcal urethritis and recurrent cervicitis, for example. So we're still trying to figure out if, for example, I was to test regularly and this patient was asymptomatic, would that person likely develop uh, a, a PID? or a cervicitis, or a non-gonococcal urethritis. Not, not sure right now, but That's right true. now what we do know is in symptomatic individuals, there has been an increase in mycoplasma genitalium being noted in individuals who are symptomatic with these entities. And if you treat it, you theoretically, if you were to go back and test in a month or two, would you expect that test to be negative? Yes, hopefully. But what I will say is test of cure is not recommended right now. It's not okay. one of the things that we have to do a test of cure. Um, and so I right now, per the guidelines, there is no recommendation for test of cure. Ideally, you want to see symptom resolution. And if symptom resolution does not occur after success, successful long treatment, sure, you can retest, right? If a person continues to be symptomatic, you can retest for mycoplasma genitalium. But if it is negative, then you have to look at the other causes of non-gonococcal urethritis, which there is an extensive list of things that can cause non-gonococcal urethritis. And up to like 40% of cases, actually, we don't know what the cause is, which is a fascinating statistic for me and a fascinating area of, of future research and, and looking into this. One last question. I've seen some tests at my hospital where it's sort of like a mycoplasma, urea plasma combo test. We shouldn't be doing any of that stuff. We need to focus on mycoplasma genitalium. Yeah. And is there anything to be said for these other mycoplasma tests nope. and ure urea plasma? That's that's just like not science type thing or it these exist in the urinary tract, but so far they haven't been associated with 
the disease entities that we were describing above. We haven't been seeing increasing rates. There are very few studies that have shown minor associations here and there within specific subgroups. We haven't been seeing it. So what I want to emphasize here is that urea plasma, urea lyticum is actually colonizer in the urinary tract and mycoplasma hominis exists in the urinary tract normally. So we should not be testing look for it. it. Yeah, well, because if you look for it, it's going to be like, aha, there is the cause when in yeah. fact, actually that is just a red herring. That is just something that happens to exist in the urinary tract and is not likely going to be the causative agent that you are looking for. Whereas mycoplasma genitalium can cause and has been associated with these disease entities. Love that. That makes so much sense to me. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs>